Okay, I think uh, we'll make a start. So, in the last lecture, I explained uh, the deformation matrix for the shape change that accompanies mitocytic transformation, so that for any direction, you can work out the strain. And I'll just go through that again. So, we had a deformation matrix, which, uh, um, oops. S zero one zero where S is the shear strain. This is zero zero and one plus delta and delta is the dilatational strain. And if I multiply it by any vector, and the example that we took was one zero one, then I get a result by taking row by column as one plus S zero and one plus delta. So this is our deformation matrix which is defined with respect to a coordinate system Z. This is an initial vector U and this is what happens to that vector after the deformation and if I draw a little sketch if this is my vector U then the vector V might point in a different direction and also have a different magnitude. So the strain is approximately equal to the strain epsilon, oops, epsilon is uh, approximately equal to 1 minus the magnitude of V divided by the magnitude of U. And if I take uh, the shear strain as about 0 0.26 and the dilatational strain as about 3%, then I get the epsilon as approximately 14 percent elongation. Okay? So the effect of mitocytic transformation in that coordinate system uh, on a vector 101 is to stretch it by about 14 percent. Okay? Now in trip steels we produce stable austenite but when we apply a stress uh, that austenite decomposes into martensite, right? That's the whole basis of trip steels is that we have some austenite, apply a stress and you trigger martensitic transformation. So what that stress is doing is adding a mechanical driving force. Okay? And we need to work out the magnitude of that driving force. So in trip steels, we have stable austenite. And the effect of the stress is to induce martensitic transformation. And the stress induces martensitic transformation. And it does that by adding a mechanical driving force. Okay? So just like we can trigger martensitic transformation by cooling okay. that by cooling we are increasing the chemical free energy change instead of cooling we apply a stress and that adds a mechanical driving force which can trigger martensitic transformation so we need to calculate need to calculate a mechanical driving force So, any ideas how I could do that? If I gave you a stress, how do I work out the energy per unit volume when the stress does work on the mountain side? Hmm? Yeah, so you remember that uh, earlier on in one of the lectures, I drew a stress versus strain graph and you identified that the area under this graph is the work done by the stress in creating the strain epsilon. So this is an energy per unit volume per unit volume. The only difference now is that we are not dealing with elastic strains. 
Martensitic transformation is a plastic strain, right? So how does that modify that area? Yeah, plastic strain is that, yeah? So it's just stress times the strain, right? So our, our driving force will be simply stress multiplied by the strain. Okay, so if I plot a graph of the free energy versus temperature, and let's call this zero, and this is the driving force, delta G, then as I cool my sample, the driving force for the gamma to alpha transformation will become more negative. Yeah? That means there's a reduction in free energy when martensite forms. And when that value reaches a critical quantity here, which we'll call delta G at MS, we trigger martensite. And this is our definition of the martensite start temperature. Okay? So this is nothing new. I've taught you that in the first couple of lectures, that when the driving chemical free energy change reaches a critical value, you trigger martensite. Now, if we are adding a driving force due to stress, then the MS temperature, will it increase or decrease? That's a question. If I add a stress, will the MS temperature increase or decrease? Hmm? Increase. So uh, here is the graph where I also add a mechanical driving force, U. So U is the mechanical driving force. Okay. And clearly, this temperature here, we will call MS sigma. Therefore, the MS temperature increases to MS sigma. And the quantity U is simply equal to the normal stress on the habit plane multiplied by delta plus the shear stress on the habit plane multiplied by S. So this is the normal stress. And this is the shear stress. on the habit plane. And because S and delta are plastic strains, we don't have a factor of a half in there. Okay? It's simply stress multiplied by the strain. Everyone happy with that? So obviously, if I'm pulling my sample along one axis, I've got to resolve that stress onto the habit plane as a shear stress and also a stress normal to the habit plane. Yeah. So if I uh, draw the habit plane here, so this is my plate of martensite, and I've applied a stress in this direction, then I've got to resolve that stress into a normal stress which will be at 90 degrees, so this is sigma n, and a shear stress here, which is parallel to the habit plane. So let's assume that the angle between the tensile axis and the normal to the habit plane is theta. Okay, so this angle here between the normal stress and the normal to the habit plane, between the stress and the normal to the habit plane is theta. Okay, so angle between sigma and normal to the habit plane. Oops, 
is theta. Okay, so theta is the angle between tensile stress and normal to the habit plane. This is my tensile stress here, sigma. This is the normal to the habit plane. Okay. And this angle here is theta. So I can express my tensile axis in terms of theta. It's, it will be a vector which has coordinates uh, sine theta in the habit plane, cos theta in the normal direction. So the tensile stress is a vector, uh, is parallel to, sigma is parallel to sine theta, zero, cos theta. And I'm assuming now that the stress, the habit plane normal, and the shear direction are lying in the same plane, okay? So that's a simplification. They don't necessarily need to lie in the same plane. So that's my tensile axis. And I want to find the elongation if the whole of the sample transforms into martensite. So how do I do that? I've defined the direction of my tensile axis, okay? And I want to find the elongation if the entire sample transforms into martensite. Yep. Given any vector, yeah, how do I find the elongation along that direction when martensite forms? Any ideas? I simply take my deformation matrix and multiply it by that vector, right? But first, I need to also find the normal stress and the shear stress so that I can work out the optimum value of theta. So we need to find, we need to find the normal stress and the shear stress on habit plane to calculate the optimum value of theta. theta. You know, because if a plate is like this, then the mechanical driving force will be different from if a plate is oriented like this, right? So there will be certain plates which have the largest interaction with the applied stress and that is what we call variant selection. That means the plates which interact the most with the applied stress will be the ones that are favored over all other possibilities. So there are 24 possible orientations of martensite and those orientations which interact the most with the stress will be the ones that are favored. Okay, so that's called variant selection. So the largest uh, plates with theta corresponding to largest mechanical free energy will be favored. And this is known as variant selection.
Okay, let me just go through that uh, again. So this is how we calculate the Martin side start temperature. If we plot the difference between the gamma and alpha as a function of temperature, when it reaches a critical value, which is delta G at MS, then we trigger the Martin Siddiq transformation. And typically, delta G Mx is, uh, is about 1,000 joules per mole because in the first two lectures, we worked out the strain energy and the interface energy and the twin interface energy. And roughly, that comes to 1,000 joules per mole. So for any system for which you can calculate the free energy, you should be able to estimate the Martin side start temperature. When we apply a stress, we have to add another term because of the interaction of the stress with the plasticity due to transformation, and that's this term U. And that has the effect of raising the Martin side start temperature so that your sample can be induced to transform into Martin side by a deformation as opposed to by cooling, right? Now, here is a beautiful experiment, which I did, okay? <laughs> where in one single test I can look at the effect of stress, changing stress on martensite. Yeah, so this is not a parallel gauge length. You can see that it is a tapered gauge length. Yeah? So when I break the sample, I will get a gradient of stress. And indeed, you can see that as a function of stress, I get more martensite as the stress increases because the mechanical driving force increases. Okay? And this is what I mean by variant selection, is that if I simply quenched this sample, then in each austenite grain, there's a possibility of 24 different orientations of plates. Okay? But can you see that these are forming at approximately 45 degrees to the tensile axis? The tensile axis is horizontal. Yeah? Why at roughly 45 degrees? Uh, the shear stress is maximum at 45 degrees when you pull the sample, yeah? But be careful, I'm saying approximately 45, because we don't just have shear stress, we also have that dilatation, okay? So when you get fewer variants than the 24, because they are forming in a particular orientation favored by the stress, you call that variant selection, yeah? Have you come across that term before? So if you read papers on trip steels and so on, you'll find that not all possible orientations of martensite form, some are favored over others, okay? and that's called variant selection. So here, those plates which are inclined at roughly 45 degrees are the ones that form. Okay? Okay, so now I want to split the stress, uh, the tensile stress, into a shear stress and a normal stress as a function of the orientation of the plate. Okay? Now, did you have a chance to look at the Moore circle construction or have you done it before? Yeah? So I'll go through it very briefly. Okay? So if a plate is at an angle theta to the tensile axis, then on this plot, I draw a line, uh, a circle first, whose diameter is sigma 1, that's your tensile stress. Okay? And from the center, I draw a line which is at an angle 2 theta, where theta is the angle between the tensile axis and the normal, right? And then I can read off here the shear stress experienced on the habit plane, and this value here is the normal stress on the habit plane, okay? So I can write down my interaction energy very simply. So the normal stress is equal to sigma 1 upon 2, where sigma 1 is your, uh, is your tensile stress. Um, if I go back to this diagram, you can see that on the horizontal axis, I've got sigma 1 upon 2, and this value here is sigma 1 upon 2 cos 2 theta, right? Just, just this. This distance here is sigma 1 upon 2 cos 2 theta, and this is sigma 1 upon 2. Therefore, I can write my normal stress as sigma 1 upon 2, 1 plus cos 
of 2 theta and the shear stress is uh, go back to that diagram you can see on the vertical axis that sigma 1 upon 2 sine 2 theta this height over here between that dot and the horizontal line is sigma 1 upon 2 sine 2 theta right sigma 1 upon 2 into sine 2 theta so my interaction energy becomes sigma 1 upon 2 this will be uh, the normal stress has to be multiplied by delta okay so I have delta plus delta cos 2 theta and the stress has to be multiplied by the shear strain so I have plus s into sine 2 theta so this is now expressed in terms of the tensile stress sigma 1 so how do I find the optimum value of theta the largest uh, value of u yeah somebody said it hmm? louder you know I'm old now I can't hear very well yeah differentiate and find the maximum so let's just do a differentiation and I might get this wrong so check everything I'm doing uh, du by d theta will equal um, the first term disappears because it doesn't have a theta so it's just uh, sigma 1 upon 2 uh, minus sigma 1 upon 2 into delta sine 2 theta plus uh, uh, sorry there should be a 2 there as well right so um, I'll put 2 sigma 1 over there okay <laughs> plus uh, 2 sigma 1 upon 2 into s cos 2 theta and if you set that to 0 and um, cancel out terms which don't matter then you'll find that the tangent of 2 theta is equal to s over delta therefore set it equal to 0 and therefore tangent of 2 theta is equal to s upon delta and that will be you'll find that theta is approximately 45 but not exactly 45 okay and theta comes to approximately 45 degrees when s is equal to 0 0.26 and delta is equal to 0 0.03 So the plates which happen to be at that angle will be favored by the stress. Right, now the problem becomes simple. We know the value of theta. Okay? We know that the tensile axis is located at uh, uh, sine theta, zero, cos theta. That's, those are the coordinates of the tensile axis. Okay, you remember that the stress sigma 1 is parallel to sine theta 0 cos 2 theta okay and we know the value of theta from that equation that we've derived tan 2 theta equals s over delta so all I have to do is multiply my deformation matrix by this direction of the tensile axis and I've got the elongation okay so Let me see if I have an exact value, uh, but you can work that out for yourself, all right? So all I have to do is take my matrix 10S010 and 001 plus delta, multiply by the vector sine theta 0 cos theta. So this is my tensile. Uh, the direction of the tensile stress and that will give you uh, 
um, sine theta plus s cos theta 0 and 1 plus delta into cos theta. And you can substitute the value, optimum value of theta in there. And when you do that, you will find that if all of the austenite transforms into the most favored variant, then you will get an elongation of 15%. So that's the maximum amount of transformation plasticity that you can get. Okay? If all of your austenite transforms and it transforms into the plates which are optimally oriented. So, if you substitute optimum value of theta, value of theta, then the elongation comes to approximately 15% if all gamma transforms into optimum martensite. Okay, so martensite oriented at the largest interaction energy U. Now, how much retained austenite does an ordinary trip assisted steel contain? That means not something that's fully austenitic, but the sort of things that you work on. Yeah? How much retained austenite typically do you have? In a trip assisted steel that, you know, POSCO manufactures and many other companies make, how much retained austenite is there? Yeah, 10, 10 20 percent maximum. Okay? So, how can I calculate the maximum elongation that I should expect if that 10% of austenite transforms? 1. Only 1.5% elongation due to transformation plasticity. Okay? Because you scale this by the fraction of austenite. So, you only get 1.5% elongation if all of the austenite in your trip assisted steel transforms into martensite. Yeah. So the idea that transformation plasticity itself gives us the large elongation in trip assisted steels is wrong. Okay. And a few years ago I wrote a two page paper with the title trip assisted steels question mark because the transformation plasticity itself is incredibly small only 1.5% and yet you get elongation of about 25% when you have austenite there. You know, the reason why we put austenite there is because it increases the elongation, right? So why is that? Transformation plasticity itself is tiny, but there's no doubt that you get more elongation if you have the austenite there. Yeah, so let, let's just write that down because it's important. So, in a steel with 10% gamma, the maximum transformation-induced plasticity is 0 0.1 multiplied by 15%, which is 1.5 percent, 1.5 percent, okay, which is much smaller than the elongation of the steel. So, the transformation is doing something else, okay? What it is doing is it is introducing work hardening inside your material. Now, why is work hardening important? 
if you get a plastic instability in your sample, that means a little bit of a neck developing, and the austenite transforms there locally, then it will harden that region and stop that neck from thinning. Right? So it's a composite effect of the creation of martensite, the creation of dislocations, and so on, which gives you the hardening in the region where you get necking, and therefore it stops the necking. Okay? So it's, it's not transformation plasticity by itself, but the fact that you introduce work hardening in regions where you have a plastic instability, a small reduction of area compared with the rest of the sample. Okay? So, the real contribution of the retained austenite, the real contribution of retained austenite is not transformation plasticity by itself but work hardening. In other words, preventing the onset of plastic instability. So, preventing the onset of plastic instability. So this, this was the calculation of the maximum strain that we expect if the entire sample was fully osmotic and transformed into the optimum orientation of um, martensite. Everyone happy with that? So that's quite an important result which you don't normally find in papers or in books. Okay. Problem is, we've got 38% nickel and nobody is going to buy that steel because it'll be very expensive, right? So, steel people are very clever. They created a steel in which you can retain austenite with the cheapest possible alloying element. So, which is the cheapest possible alloying element? Carbon, okay? And uh, this has been known for hundreds, at least 100 years, that if you add silicon, then you stop cementite precipitation during the bainite reaction. So all you do is you take a steel, you transform it partly into bainite, that partitions carbon and the carbon remains in the austenite and stabilizes the austenite. Yeah? So silicon doesn't dissolve in cementite and that's the reason why cementite is suppressed. So you've got an incredibly cheap steel uh, in which you retain austenite without adding expensive alloying additions. And it looks something like this and it Almost all trip-assisted steels have roughly this composition, 0.158% carbon, 1.5% silicon purely there to stop cementite precipitation during the bainite reaction, and 1.5% manganese to give you hardenability. About 70% of the microstructure is just allotriomorphic ferrite, okay? and the remainder is transformed into a mixture of bainite and carbon-enriched retained austenite, and that retained austenite typically has a carbon concentration in excess of one weight percent. Okay? So even though your steel has an average composition of only 0.15, you partition the carbon and the austenite is very rich in carbon and that's what stabilizes it. Okay? So it's very, very clever because you need a small amount of carbon if you want to weld the material, otherwise you get brittle martensite forming during spot welding. So, the overall carbon concentration must be low, and it is, it's at 0 0.15, but you distribute the carbon 
heterogeneously inside your material by this very clever heat treatment so that the austenite contains more than one weight percent carbon. Incredibly clever idea. And you can produce this in two ways, okay? The, the a common way is you start with a fully austenitic sample, you generate about 70% of allotriomorphic ferrite at high temperatures, and then you transform it into bainite at around 400 degrees centigrade, which is roughly also the temperature at which you might galvanize the material, okay? Uh, alternatively, you can start with a cold rolled steel and heat it up into an intercritical zone where austenite and ferrite can coexist. So you have your annealed ferrite and then you've generated retained austenite and then transform it here into bainite. Uh, and th this, this process itself takes a few minutes. Yeah? So this is a continuous production line. You, know? you can produce hundreds and hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of tons of this material. Yeah? You know, when you think about this, this is an absolutely brilliant technology, much more, much more clever, I think, than even computers. Yeah? Because it's beautiful. You don't need any human intervention. The steel is flowing through your continuous energy line and producing your cars. And you can see that we get a high strength because we've got a mixture of hard and soft phase. Yeah? and you get continuous yielding, again because you've got a mixture of soft and hard. Because when you have a mixture of soft and hard, you have lots of free dislocation generated as soon as you start to deform it, so you don't get a yield point effect. A yield point effect is no good for formability. Uh, much, much stronger than normal steels, and still you get a very respectable elongation from these steels. Now, I have a lot more that I could say about trip steels, but unfortunately I don't have time today because I have to go to a meeting now, all right? But we have one more lecture left, so I will cover the rest of it in the next lecture, okay? But we'll stop early today, all right? Thank you.